Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to Midway for our worship. Um, we're so grateful for your presence and grateful for the opportunity we have to come together today. At, um, at this time, I'd like to ask you to make sure you get, get a bulletin uh, so you can stay up to date uh, on all our events going on here at Midway and community-wide and, and also uh, see those that have requested prayer or the events that we need to be in prayer uh, about if you're a guest, uh, we ask that you kind of stick around so we can meet you. We'd love to meet you um, at the end of the service. And uh, if you're looking for a church home, we'd love for you to consider Midway as you make that choice. Um, this time, if you don't mind, if you'll turn off all your or, or silence all your electronic devices so we don't have any disruptions um, during our assembly, during our worship time and our service today, the order of service, our singing will be led by uh, Grant Addison, our opening prayer by Jeff Sparks. Our lesson will be brought to us by Mark Howell. Lord's Supper uh, by Mike Wolf, and our closing prayer uh, will be done today by Brother Ronnie Brown. Um, there are no further announcements. At this time, we'll enter into our service. As the pray together. And most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day in which we can assemble here as a family of Christians to come together and to worship you. And we thank you for the joy that we feel in conducting that worship and the fellowship that we feel with being with our fellow Christians as we encourage each other on our pathway to one day be to heaven, be in heaven with you. Father, we thank you for the work that this church is able to undertake. We thank you for uh, the, the mission work in Romania. You, we pray that you'll be with the churches in Romania as well as uh, the uh, churches um, that are uh, in the Ukraine and are under attack by hostile forces. We pray that they might work together and that, that they might find safety and there might be a an ending to those those uh, wars in that area and that uh, the church might rebuild in the area and, and be strong. We thank you for our elders and their wisdom to oversee us, the, the projects that we undertake. We thank you for our ministers, Mark and Kelly, and we pray that the upcoming Polishing the Pulpit will be a great success. And we thank you for all the work that Kelly does with our our young men and young women of this church, and 
We pray that you'll be with those young men and young women as they start their school year, and we pray that they'll they'll learn much and they'll have much enjoyment out of sports and bands and other activities that they're able to participate in. And we thank you that as a congregation we're richly blessed with coaches and teachers that encourage them and that are solid Christians and will help mold these children to be the kind of Christians that that they should be. Father, we pray that you'll be with our nation, that in the past our leaders saw fit to designate certain rights that were God-given and understand that God gave us those rights, not the government, and that they limited the government's power to encroach upon them. And we pray that as the politics of this nation ebb and flow, that uh, we will always be able to enjoy those rights and that we will always be able to assemble together and worship you without uh, outside interference. Father, we pray for those of our number who have asked an interest in our prayer. We pray that you'll be with Janice Jackson. Uh, she's lost her husband and her son and pray with her as her son Scotty as uh, undergoing treatments and not doing well at this point. Pray that you'll be with our senior saints, Patty, <clears throat> Patty and Perry Sue, uh, Patty Sue and Perry Crump, uh, Kim Urkel, uh, Kim Sanjo, Clayton <clears throat> Trawick, and Gene Wilcutt, and also uh, Richard Rogers, worked many years with this congregation. We're thankful for the improvements of the baby girl, uh, Malia Wren Chambers. Pray that you'll be with her parents and grandparents as uh, she continues to improve. Father, we thank you for your son and the life that he lived here on earth and the, the redemption from sins that we gain through his death on the cross. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
to our service this morning. We're so thankful that you're here, glad that you've chosen to be with us here at the Midway Congregation. As we begin our lesson this morning, you may or may not have heard of a man by the name of Sean Cohn. Now, Mr. Cohn is quite an interesting guy. He is a 
uh, a researcher of sorts, quirky, uh, though he might be, but what he does, a lot of the things that he does, is that he'll do research on movies regarding various things, and, and one of the things that he did some research on, spent seven months doing it, was looking up how many movies he could find in which a certain phrase was used. And the phrase that he was looking at in this particular uh, scenario was the phrase you may have heard before, that's going to leave a mark. Now, he found 105 times that phrase is used in, in various movies. It's used in one called, many people know the movie Tommy Boy, but it's used not only in Tommy Boy, it's used in the Santa Claus 2, the Santa Claus 3, and a number of other movies. But that's going to leave a mark. Well, when we think about that, we know when we talk about leaving a mark, we talk about something that is going to leave an impression of some kind. It may not be a good one. It may be, you know, a, a, a scar. It may be a bruise. It may be something like that, or it may be something good. But you know what? In the Bible, we read about marks being left. If you have your Bible with you this morning, turn with us to the book of John, chapter 20, look at verse number 25. John chapter 20, verse number 25. The Bible says, So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark in his hands, uh, mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Now, we know him as Thomas. This is the one who wanted to put his finger in the mark. He wanted to see the marks that were left. When Jesus was crucified, when those nails were put into His hands, into His feet, the spear was thrust into His side, they all left a mark. Now, the word that's used here is quite interesting. The word, if you look at it in the original language, it is simply spelled T-U-P-O, uh, T-U-P-O-S, tupos. Now, if we think about it a little bit, what we might come to understand is that's where we get our word typo or typos. In other words, many people, some of you here at least, have seen a typewriter. When we think about typewriters, if you go back a long way, you can think about one of those old manual typewriters where there would be a, a, a key that you would press and an arm would go up and it would hit a ribbon and it would leave a mark on the, on the paper. It would actually leave the letter that you had put it up there. Now, I came along and I remember those, but... When I finally got into typing class when I was going to school, didn't do too good in it. I mean, I passed it and everything, but my two-finger kind of thing wasn't, wasn't really what they wanted to see. But you know what? We had just gotten, we were the first class that had these brand new IBM typewriters that had the little round ball on it that, you know, it would go up and spin and hit the thing. And, and man, that just made it so much easier, it seemed. But it still left a type. It still left a mark. Now, when we think about the word tupos or type, we can look at a number of passages in Scriptures. It's used and translated in various ways in Scripture. For example, in the book of Acts chapter 7 at verse number 44, the Bible says, Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern, according to the pattern that he had seen. And so the word tupos is translated pattern here. In the book of Romans chapter 6 at verse number 17, the same word is used in that passage, but Paul wrote and said, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. That's the same word translated marked back in John, translated uh, pattern as we looked at in the book of Acts. Notice in the book of Titus chapter 2 at verse number 7, that word is used yet again. In that passage, the Bible says, show yourself uh, in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching show integrity and dignity. And so the word translated model here is the same word that we have been looking at. But probably one of the most famous usages of the word translated mark or uh, pattern or model or one of these is found in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4 at verse number 12. 1 Timothy chapter 4 at verse number 12. And it's there when Paul writes to Timothy, he said, 
Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. The word translated example here is the same word that we have been talking about from these other various passages. Now, if you were with us last Sunday morning, you remember that the thing that we talked about was peer pressure. And when we talk about peer pressure, many times we think about negative peer pressure. And, and we talked about it in relation to our young folks going back to school and peer pressure that may have been placed or may be placed upon them through the school year. But when we think about peer pressure and think about it from a negative viewpoint, that's not a good thing. However, when one is a good example, as we read about here in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 12, and shows a pattern, sets a standard, acts as a model for others, they can be a positive influence on others. And isn't that really what we want to do? We want to influence people, and we're going to influence people one way or the other, but we really want to be a positive influence on other folks. And so this morning, let's talk a little bit about this uh, idea of being an, uh, an example, a, a positive example, a positive influence on others. And we'll do that by looking at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 12, just a little bit. Let's begin this morning by looking at the context of the verse. The, the, what is it that when Paul tells Timothy that he needs to set an example before the believers... What is it that he's talking about? Well, if you back up to verse number 11, he had just told. Now, verse 12 is where he says, leave the example, set the example. But notice in verse number 11, he says, command and teach these things. That's the entirety of verse number 11. Command and teach these things. Well, <coughs> immediately what I want to think about is, well, Paul, what are you telling Timothy to command and to teach? What is it that you have in mind. In the immediate context, staying in chapter number four, in the same chapter that we have that we're looking at from which the, the passage uh, about being an example is uh, spoken, we know that in verses one through five, Paul discusses the apostasy of the church. He talks about how that, that the church people, would Christians would, would go astray, how that they would have these various things. And and it's not our purpose this morning to deal with all of those things or talk about them in detail, but I hope you'll go back and you'll look at verses 1 through 5 and see the things that Paul is warning against and he's telling Timothy to warn against. In verse number 7 of chapter number 4, he makes it clear that Timothy nor any of the Christians should fall prey to uh, false man-made teachings. And they should not do that. In verses 8 through 10, he talks about godliness. In contrast to physical prowess, he said godliness is really what makes the difference. It's not about the physical part of life that we are indeed instructed to be concerned. But not only that, if you go back to chapter 3, in chapter 3, Timothy is told about appointing elders and he's given the qualifications of elders. He's also given the qualifications of deacons and also of deacons' wives that are mentioned here in 1 Timothy chapter 3. And so you can see just from the sampling that we have taken that the subject matter that Timothy is set to command and teach has some things within it that's some pretty heavy stuff. It's pretty, it's pretty, you know, grave in, in its uh, content. And so uh, Timothy's going to have a tough job ahead of him. He's going to have some things. And, and the people that Timothy are going to be teaching these things to, many of them are going to be older and more mature than him. But in that day, we need to remember, and especially in other cultures, it's not maybe as much in our own culture now, unfortunately, but those who were older were considered to be wiser, and as a result of that, there was more respect that was assigned to them. And so age was associated with wisdom and carried the weight of more respect. It, it, it was just that simple. 
And so Paul had to give Timothy some special instructions. Remember, he said, Timothy, you are to command and teach these things. And so <clears throat> as you do that, here's an instruction that I'm having to give you. And one of the things that he tells him is he says, let no man despise you for your youthfulness. Let no one despise you for your youth. The word despise means simply to feel contempt for someone or something because it is thought to be bad or without value. And so you can imagine some of the older folks who were listening to Timothy as he commanded and taught these things. <coughs> they may well have said, okay, this really coming from a, uh, a younger person uh, really has no value within it. It's interesting to me that the word also means to disdain or think little of, or little or nothing of. And it's the word that's used in Hebrews chapter 12 at verse number 2. When the Bible is speaking about Jesus and His crucifixion, the Bible says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. On the top of Jesus' list of good things to do would not have been being crucified. He despised not just the crucifixion, but the shame that was associated with that. Now, I don't have time to deal with that in this lesson, but we're going to talk a little bit about it in class this morning. And so for those who are in my class, we'll talk a little bit more about that in that setting. And so as we look at it, we know that Timothy is told by the Apostle Paul, don't let people look down upon you just because of your youth. But then there's that word youth. It's used there. We think about it. We talk about it. We preach about it. The word youth. The word youth, that same word is used in the book of Mark chapter 10 at verse number 20. And he said to him, teacher, all these things have I kept from my youth. Here's the rich young ruler. We don't know how old he was, but he says he had done that. The word just means youthfulness, youthfulness. And, and so as we look at it, this word translated youth in this passage, as well as in 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 12, it is what we might call a relative term. And if you consult the scholars, the Greek scholars in regard to it, it's interesting what they have to say in regard to that word. Uh, when we think about it, this word being a relative term, we really need to think about Timothy himself. We're first introduced to Timothy back in the book of Acts, chapter number 16. Paul's on his second missionary journey, and according to Acts chapter 16 at verse number 1, Paul came to Derby and Lystra, and there he found a disciple. A disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. Here we find Timothy, first time that he's mentioned. <coughs> and when Timothy is mentioned here, I want you to notice how he's described. Timothy is referred to as a disciple, right? Isn't that what we just read? Timothy is a disciple. He's already a believer. He's already a Christian. He's already, <coughs> excuse me, working in the, in the Lord's church. Timothy had likely been converted on Paul's first missionary journey. Now remember I said uh, we are introduced to him on his second missionary journey. But Timothy is very likely converted by Paul on his first missionary journey when he came to, to Lystra and Derby. And so as we look at him there, again, we understand that he has uh, been serving. Now, in 1 Timothy chapter 1 at verse number 2, Paul calls Timothy his own true son in the faith. And so that's why our true child in the faith, as ESV puts it, that's why we say he is the one uh, very likely had uh, been converted by the Apostle Paul himself. And Timothy had proven himself in the time since his conversion until the time that Paul comes back. He had proven himself to be a faithful brother. Look at Acts chapter 16 at verse number 2. He was well spoken of by the brothers 
at Lystra and at Iconium. And, and so they had observed him, they had seen, they had known him. Now, here's where we get back to the term youth. Paul's first stop at Lystra and Derby was in about 48 A.D. About 48 A.D. Paul's second trip, his second stop there, was somewhere around 51 A.D. Most believe Timothy to have been converted when he was likely between the ages of 16 to 21. In that age range. And, and so... As he has come up, he has grown in from a teenager into a young man. And it's in about A.D. 51 when Paul wants to take Timothy as a partner in preaching the gospel. Okay, because of his good work that he's doing in his own hometown, in the surrounding areas. And so it's about 51 A.D. Now, at that time, if he was converted at the age of 16, he would have been around 19. If he was converted by the age 21, he's probably already around 24 years old. But then there's the letter that Paul would write to Timothy. And Paul would not write that letter until about 64 or 65 A.D. Around 64, 65 A.D., some 13 to 14 years after he had taken Timothy to be a co-worker. Now, I'm not a math teacher. I'm not a math scholar. But I can add and subtract a little bit, especially if I use a calculator that those teachers when I was growing up said, you won't have one in your pocket. Well, I do have one in my pocket right now. Everybody else does too, pretty much. But that would make Timothy likely between the ages of 32 to 38 years old. When you imagine Paul writing to Timothy and saying, let no one despise your youth, how old do you think he is in your mind? Well, I'm thinking about a young whippersnapper. Hadn't even finished high school yet, but he's a good preacher and a good worker. But that's likely not the case. I mentioned the word translated youth there a little while ago. I said it was a relative term. According again to the scholars, it can refer to someone up to the age of around 40 years old. Timothy still fits within that, doesn't he? He's still considered one who hasn't reached the age of being one who is wise because of his age. And so Paul instructs him to let no one despise him for his age. Now, as I think about that verse, and I think about the passage that we're discussing from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 12 this morning, it leads me to a question. Which was more important as far as Timothy himself is concerned? Not allowing people to look down on it? Or him setting an example for others, which is more important. Now, don't get me wrong, both are important, or the Holy Spirit would not have directed the Apostle Paul to write those things to him. But I ask the question in a specific way, which was more important for Timothy, as far as Timothy is concerned? Which one is more important? Well, Timothy couldn't control the actual thinking of others, could he? He couldn't place them under a spell and say, you've got to think in this way, or, you know, he couldn't do that. He can't control people's thinking any more than you and I can control people's thinking. Now, God can control it, and God miraculously could have controlled their thinking in regard to Timothy, but God chose even before he created mankind to allow mankind to be a free moral agent. You can choose to believe and think any way you want to, and I won't stop you. You may be wrong, but God won't stop us. 
And Timothy himself, just as we can, we cannot necessarily change the thinking of another person in the way that they react to us and, and, and all of that. But you know what Timothy could control? Timothy could only control what he did. The only person under Timothy's control was Timothy, right? And as a result of that, one of the things that was most important for Timothy himself, as far as he was concerned, is that he needed to be the right example. <clears throat> he needed to be one who was setting a pattern, who was being the standard of conduct for people so that they could look up to him and say, this is a good man. This is a Christian man. And as a result of that, they would be more inclined to listen to him as he taught and commanded them the things that were from God. His youthfulness, even though he may not have been a youth as far as some are concerned today, he may not have been, you know, in his late 20s or, 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 or late teens, early 20s. When Paul writes about his youthfulness, but he still had to be the right example. He didn't need to be looked down upon because of how old he was. And you know what? <clears throat> Just because he may have been a little bit older than what we sometimes picture him in our own mind, that doesn't mean that our young people, teenagers and above, are off the hook that they shouldn't be good examples in the way that they live. And, and so as we look at it, all of what is said here is not just for young teenage people. It really and truly extends even to those of us who have gotten older. We are all to still be the right kind of example. Now in the remaining time that we have, the remaining portion of our lesson this morning, there's some specific areas in which one should be an example, and especially as Timothy is told by the Apostle Paul. Again, going back to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 12, let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. Let's look at these individually just a little bit this morning. Let's look first at the word speech. He says you're to be an example in speech. May I ask you something? Be very serious with yourself as you answer this question. What is coming out of your mouth? When you speak on a daily basis, what is coming out of your mouth? Complaints? Discouragement? Lies? Gossip, profanity, or is it better things? And I sure hope it's better things. And I know from the mouths of most, it is better things. But you see, we have to ask ourselves, what is coming out of my mouth? Nothing exhibits our character more than the way that we speak. The way we talk lets everybody know who we are. There's nothing that puts it on display any more than what we say and how we say it. And so it is important for us. Why is speech important? First, or rather, Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37, Jesus said, I tell you, on the day of judgment, that's a pretty important day, isn't it? On the day of judgment, people will give account for what? Every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Is speech important? 100%. We need to be careful. I read about a preacher who... Before becoming a preacher, while he was still young, was a stock uh, boy at one of the local grocery stores. And he gives an account of, uh, of a lady that comes in. And he, he said from the time that she came in, 
The only thing that she did was complain. He said she complained about everything from the prices. No, complained about those lately. She complained about everything from the prices, the smell of the store. And he said even the way he was bagging her groceries, nothing but complaints were coming out of his, her mouth. He said he carried her groceries to the car for, and as they were walking to her car, she complained about how the parking lot was laid out. And she complained about how hot it was outside. Complain, complain, complain. He said, I put her groceries in the car, and she said, have a nice day. Now think about that for a minute. Nothing had come out of her mouth except complaints, and then she says, have a nice day. And he said, I thought, I was until I met you. Do we have that effect on people? A lot of times when we talk about speech, we talk about saying bad words. We talk about lying or gossiping or things like that. I mentioned those already. But what about these other things? How many people could Timothy have influenced for good if he was a griper and a complainer like some folks are? Some folks, if you handed them a million dollars, they would complain because you didn't put it in the right denominations of money that they wanted. They said, why didn't you put more fives in there? I don't need all hundreds. Folks, we need to be careful, don't we? Paul said, be careful how you speak. In the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verse 6, Paul wrote and said, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Again, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 16, at verse 24, Gracious words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul, and health to the body. Not just what you say, but how you say it. Here's a prayer we should probably should pray every morning. It's found in the book of Psalm 19, verse number 14. The psalmist wrote, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. How many times do we pray that when we get up? Paul said, be an example in speech. He also said, be an example in conduct. Young folks, and even those who have grown older, have your parents or did your parents ever tell you, settle down and behave? Emphasis on that last part, behave. If we're to set an example in our speech, we're also to set it in our behavior. In fact, the word conduct refers to our behavior. And if our speech is important, our lifestyle needs to match the words that we're speaking, doesn't it? Our lifestyle needs to match what we claim to believe. If we say we're a Christian, our lifestyle needs to match that, don't we? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new has come. Stop acting like one who is still in sin. And start acting like one whose sins have been forgiven. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 1 at verse 15, But as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Same word. 1 Peter chapter 2 at verse number 12, Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as an evildoer, they may see your good works and glorify God on the day of visitation. They may not say good things about you right now, but the day of visitation that he's speaking about here is when they're judged. And when they think back on the judgment day at how you acted around them, and they think about why they're going to be lost because of their bad actions toward you and other things, they can say, well, God, that person sure was a good example that he set before me. I wish I'd listened. Set an example in conduct. Number three, set an example in love, he says. 
one of the key qualities that makes us most like Christ is our willingness to love other people. Our willingness to love other people. Folks, I'm going to be blunt. Sometimes we allow our prejudices to make us not like Jesus. It may be racial. It may be economical. It may be some other area. But we allow our prejudices to overshadow our willingness to love. Do you remember what Jesus said? When asked what is the first and great commandment? Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Too many, too many want to take the first and forget the second. And not only that, too many have misunderstood even the idea, the concept of love. They think it's an emotion that accepts everything and never, ever, in any way, would offend anyone. And that is not what Jesus meant when He said, love your neighbor as yourself. Answer this question. Was Jesus the perfect example of love? You have to answer yes to that. Did Jesus love the lukewarm Laodiceans that we read about in the book of Revelation, chapter number 3? I know He did because He said in verse number 19, those whom I love, I let them do anything they want to do. I reprove and discipline so be zealous and repent. Because Jesus loved them, He said, you've got to make a change. Again, in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 and 6, And have you forgotten the ex exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by Him, for the Lord disciplines those who He just despises. The Lord disciplines the ones He loves and chastises every son whom He receives. Love is not just an overwhelming exist, uh, acceptance of everything. Love sees a person who may be in error and helps them understand where they're wrong because you want them to be right. Set an example in love. Set an example in faith. Faith includes both belief and trust. To doubt God's ability to fulfill His promises is distrust. To reject part of the Bible is unwor as unworthy of acceptance. That's wrong as well. To fulfill the requirement, we must believe God's Word and, and do our best to fulfill it. And when we talk about faith, we need to remember James chapter 2, verse 17. Or 14, rather. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith, but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Good friends, it's not enough to say that you believe in God. You must live like you believe in Him. That's what Paul tells Timothy, set an example in faith. Set an example in purity. The word refers to the quality of moral purity or chastity. It can, all, it can refer to sexual purity. It can refer to having a pure heart. That's what is used in the book of Matthew chapter 5 at verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. Therefore, we must live clean lives. We must live an honest life. We must live a life that exceeds the standards of the world in regard to purity. Oh, I wish I had time to deal with that in more detail. But let's close our lesson. That's going to leave a mark. You know, that may be a common 
sometimes humorous catchphrase that's used. We understand what it means when it's used in that way. But you need to ask yourself as you begin the school year, as you go to work tomorrow, as you get up and interact with people, whoever they may be, wherever they may be, no matter what your age or what your station in life may be, am I going to leave a mark? Am I? Let me answer the question for you. Yes, you will leave a mark. You're going to leave a mark. The real question is, are you going to leave a good one? Or are you going to leave a bad one? In other words, am I going to be a good example or a bad one? Going to leave a mark. What kind of mark are you going to leave? Those with whom you have contact, whether it's family, friends, schoolmates, work, co-workers, whatever it may be. What kind are you going to leave? Paul said, let no one despise your youth, tells Timothy, but be an example. If you're here this morning, not a Christian, maybe someone who is a Christian has left a mark on you, making you want to be one. Christ certainly has left a mark on you. Would you believe in Him, repent, confess, make, the great, uh, make that great confession and be baptized into Christ? Maybe you're here and there's something amiss in your life that you want to correct. If that's the case, come right now as we stand and sing. time in our service that we normally observe the Lord's table. If you would, bow with me as I lead a prayer to give thanks for these symbols. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have blessed us so well. Most of all, we thank you that you blessed us with your son and his death upon the cross through which we might have forgiveness of our sins and that we might be someday able to live with you. It's now that we give you thanks for this bread that we're about to partake that represents his flesh that was hung on the cross for us. As we partake of it, we pray that we might do so in a manner that would be pleasing unto you. And we ask these blessings in Christ's name. 
Amen. Would you bow with me as I give thanks for the fruit of the vine? Again, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this fruit of the vine, which to us represents the blood of your Son shed on the cross for us. May we partake of it in a way and manner that will be pleasing unto you. And we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Because it's expedient to give thanks for all of the temporal blessings that he's bestowed upon us at this time, would you bow with me please while I give thanks for those material blessings. Heavenly Father, thank you that you have given us your spiritual blessings but also we want to thank you and acknowledge that all of the material blessings that we now have are yours and has come from you and that you've given them to us to use in, in your kingdom. May we at this time give a liberal portion of that back to you so that others can enjoy the spiritual blessings that we now enjoy. And we ask these blessings in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you again for your presence, and we're grateful that you're here. And thank you again, Mark, for challenging us to go out and be a great example in speech and action, and in hopes that if we do that, that we can grow the Lord's church and get more people to heaven. And we want to ask you to stick around. Um, for our Bible study hour um, following our service here and also be back with us this evening at 5 as we have our Sunday evening uh, service. We're grateful that we can do that in person now so take advantage of that and also Wednesday night classes will take place at 6.30. Um, we'll hope that you'll come back and join us then. Uh, again, get a bulletin as you leave and if you are a guest, we'd love to visit with you uh, before you leave today and this time we'll have one more song and a prayer to close out our service. Let us all pray together. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning, dear Lord, with humble hearts and humble, humble minds, just saying, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege and opportunity that you've given us to assemble in your house. We thank you, dear Lord, for everything you, we do, and uh, we thank you for everything you've given us. I know you have blessed us so much more than, dear Lord, than we deserve. We ask you, dear Lord, to continue to bless Brother Mark and thank him for the great message we heard this morning. Thank you for the beautiful singing we've heard today and thank you for Kelly, the great job he does and thank you for Grant and Ronnie as they lead the singing. They both do a good job when they lead the singing for us, dear Lord. We ask you, dear Lord, to 
be with our elders. Just be with Brother Eddie as he's preparing to go back to Romania. Just be with the continue to be with the Romanians, dear Lord, and be with the Ukrainians. It's a difficult time they're going through. Be with the Taiwanese, dear Lord, and, and I know the difficult time they're going through also. The ch China's threatening them. Just be with them and be with the, the people that we've sent over there this meeting with them this weekend, dear Lord. We ask you to get them back home safely. We ask you, dear Lord, to be with our country, and it seems as a whole that we are drifting farther and farther away from you. Uh, we, dear Lord, I ask you to to help us to get a control on our border, the crisis that's going on down there. It's thousands and thousands, it looks like a day coming over. We ask you, dear Lord, to continue to be with the, be with the people. We ask you, dear Lord, to be with the people on the prayer list. It's comfort and heal them if it be thy will. We thank you once again, dear Lord, for all that you do for us, and especially for sending your only son who died so that we may live. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.